morning, everybody, and welcome to Midnight's Edge. I'm Tom Connors. With me, as always, is the boss man, Andre. How you doing? Greetings, everyone. I am good. Getting over the non-Wuhan flu, slowly but steadily. And we also have the fifth Beatles script doctor with us. He's not a PhD, but he plays one on the internet. How you doing? I'm, I'm all right. Thanks for inviting me this morning. Glad uh, to have you here. We also have a special guest with us, Mr. H of Mr. H Reviews. How you doing? I'm good. I'm very good. You mean you mean to say, sorry, Andre, you mean to say there's seasonal viruses that are not, you know, the Rona? Are you joking? What is this? It's preposterous. Yeah, I know, but everyone <laughs> seems to think I have, like, the coof when I don't. Oh, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So I have to, like, always stress that, uh, yeah, it's the flu, but it's the non-Wuhan variety. Yeah, I, I was the same a couple you of weeks You mean back. the kind that could actually do some damage? Yeah, the the one that... Uh, that uh, uh, I would like to believe that I'm young and fit enough that it's not going to do any damage in any event. But uh, but yeah, Mister Mister Tickle Trunk has raised the uh, the fact that we had beef on Dre again. Remember? Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, hated one that another. Right another. Mister Tickle Trunk <laughs> says, "Mister H, I thought you and Andre both died long ago in a pistol duel." <sighs> well, I think that we're both uh, kicking live and well for for that duel. So uh, <laughs> that duel that took place in people's minds, um, yeah, turned out pretty well. Oh, dear. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Anyway, thanks for inviting me along. No, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll absolutely. put our we'll put our beef to one side for this stream, shall we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. People think that when you have beef. Oh, Very funny. Uh, Mr. Tickleswork also says, Mr. H, I thought you and Andre both died falling down a pit after you stopped him from chasing those hobbits. And I tried. I tried. He fell down, but I, I, I rescued him. So, Why didn't yeah. the bell rock just fly? <laughs> it yeah, true. Yeah, got a good point there, actually. Yeah, you got a good Well, they made a fire, though, aren't they? Does, does the bell rock, can they actually fly? I don't That's think. a good question, yeah. but still. Like they're falling, and I'm like, he mm. has wings. Why didn't he just fly up? Yeah, <laughs> no, you got a good point. Well, there's plenty of things in Lord of the Rings that can fly that could have been taken better advantage of. Well, right, they, so, yeah. Let's not even get into that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's not even get into that. Because we'll tear yeah, those. They, they uh, the books Eagles, what one. twice? Hmm? Uh, I don't know. The Eagles um, once or twice. I know that, and it's like, why didn't you just have them take you all the way there? <laughs> it's like, mm. Yeah, that is true. And while we're on Super Chats, one we can't get through right away is uh, from... Mm. Who says, hi, gents. Hello, everyone, with a diamond and smiley super sticker. But we have many others here as well. We have Pedro Ribeiro, who says, yeah. because Balrog's I've heard Tolkien's this. books don't have wings. And I guess this has been highly debated, because I guess in one description it does mention a wings, but, like, mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we have Natasha here representing the mods. We have Erik Runge Mods. I heard Natasha saw Denmark. Doom. Yeah, she did. I think she liked it. Uh, you have to let us know, but I think she liked it. And uh, Sontar she said she says, had a few issues, but it, she was it was pretty good, and it wasn't woke. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Sontar says a script show Tom and Andre born cop, bad cop. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's not a great movie, but it's a Canadian cop film. <laughs> it's kind of silly. Uh, it has that terrible green tint of the time it was shot, which I think was the very early 2000s. Yeah, you mean you might... Canadians made movies after John Candy passed away? Yes, no. we did. <laughs> Shocker. Yeah. Yeah. And we also have Will Bloom here. Lindsay the Cynical Geek is here. Fear is the Mind Killer is here, so he's obviously ready for Dune. Uh, Taran Chul is here. Debut Morton is here. Rambam 3000 is here. Fractal Jack is here. Jason Gray is here. And Max Mercer is here. And quite a few others. So, everyone, if you could do us a, do us a solid one, smash that like and help share the, the, the stream. And uh, then we'll be off talking about topics in no time here. And today we have Dune, since we mentioned that a little bit already, which is continuing to do fairly well in theaters where it has been released, which granted isn't everywhere, but it is doing very well where it's being released. Well, it's now uh, 34 really well. Yeah. 
and uh, well, that has great. led some people to to even speculate maybe it's not such a hot idea to drop it day on date uh, uh, on HBO Max in uh, the US after all because that's kind of going to kill its international theatrical revenue right away Mr. And, there and, I, I yeah, and we there. have uh, we have some old news resurfacing about Venom and his coming out party in conjunction with uh, with the upcoming movie uh, we have some Spawn news, you know, Todd McFarlane's Spawn. That was the old that has news. Been in, well, they're all old news getting recycled. That's been like, that's uh, getting, mm, it's been in production hell or development hell the past decades, and things aren't looking any better now, let's say. Nice. Plus, we'll see whatever else comes up. Uh, so yeah, those are our um, uh, prepared talking points, but I'm sure plenty more is going to come up. Mr. H, what's uh, what's up with you? Uh, what in life on channel? What? Yeah, all, all of the above. All of it. Well, I'm, I'm I'm pretty busy to be fair. Um, I'm also trying to correct my exposure levels right now, so let's just sort that out. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll keep it there. Right. Anyway. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm pretty busy, uh, busy on the channel in general, um, which is all, which is always good. I've got my second channel. Uh, that's been going really, really well. Like it's not massive, like it's not growing hugely, but there's this will be a car channel, out. right? Yeah. So I've got a, I've got a vlog, uh, but it's a car channel, but they're not straight up. Oh, this is how you do this. You know, it's somewhat relaxed. It's just two, two friends. It's me and my friend just hanging out, having a laugh with cars, basically. Um, it's called car nonsense. Uh, it's, it's a good, it's a good time. That's growing nicely, like very slowly. Like we're talking like a hundred subscribers a week, uh, a month, sorry. So very, very slowly, but it's good. It's good. It's been good fun. And, um, we, uh, we have the potential to go up and, um, do a track day with Renault, uh, as well as a, uh, racing driver, um, so that that's you know people have reached out to us who are organising this sort of Renault Track Day event and that could be good fun. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, so that's going really well. Um, my day to day life is is fine. Just you know, just plodding along. Really, I mean, it's autumn now. Um, speaking of cars, I'm sure you're going to raise the subject of uh, petrol in the UK because everyone. Yeah, since you just bought, uh, since you just uh, just ingrate. bought it for those that uh, for those that haven't noticed in the UK they're doing a live action remake of uh, Mad Max right now with everyone killing each nonsense. other over petrol or fuel or gasoline or yeah, diesel there, there how are. you want to put it how's that affecting you and your car channel so so me uh, it's not affecting me at all um not not at all because my one i managed to fill up before everything anyway um i don't drive because i work from home so i don't need to drive I only drive for fun uh, so it's not actually affecting me in any way um and also my cars uh, only take uh, 99 octane which is you know it's, it's a it's a high, it's the performance fuel so it's more expensive um and most people are you know scrapping and getting all shitty about the e10 fuel the sort of ethanol rated 10 it's like 90 percent octane or some crap like that i don't know it's, it's not it's not it's not good fuel um and yeah, people are like scrapping. People are literally going, you know, having full blown fights at you know four courts, you know, yeah, petrol, so well. petrol stations, and it's mental. And the hilarious part of it is, as well, is that uh, all of this could have been avoided if the media had shut their fucking mouths, because um, it had been going on for three weeks anyway. Like the you know uh, ha having issues delivering the fuel had been going on for three weeks. It then hit the media. The media talked about it, and then everyone went mental. And it's like right. You know, COVID yeah. should have told you one thing is that the average populace in the UK is an idiot, right? Like they are actual idiots. And a case in point, if anyone disagrees with me, you fucking shouldn't. But case in point, if anyone disagrees with me, COVID happened. What happened in the UK? Everyone went and bought toilet roll. Well, we had the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was thinking that. Like, this reminds me idiot. of like the of the great bug roll shortages and uh, <laughs> well i was just thinking i don't think it has yeah. i think it has more to do with just the fact that we are just so connected now even more so than we were you know even 10 20 years ago in comparison yeah. i think yeah, that's the i think you have the opportunity for like where you know you always have that friend where you can tell whatever and they just fucking turn into panic mode right yeah so now yeah, you have a yeah. hundred million or billion of them <laughs> oh honestly but it's so dumb like if, if the media hadn't bothered to say anything right like we wouldn't 
there there would be no issues. Right now, now there's a shortage. Now there's a shortage because everyone's panic bought. If they didn't panic yeah. buy and they did what they're supposed to do, which is what they normally do, because most people drive around, and you're not supposed to, but most people drive around with their car like half empty, a quarter full, that sort of thing, which is actually, if you know anything about cars, it's really bad for a car because your fuel pump relies on pressure uh, and the fuel tank actually being full. Um, you should only let it go down to half and then fill it back up um, because if you don't, you'll burn out your fuel pump. There's a free bit of advice for everyone. Um but most most people do that on a day-to-day basis and now everyone's gone, oh shit, I need to go buy fuel. Idiots. Absolute idiots. Uh but it's not been affecting me and yeah, things are things are fine with me, basically. Just plodding along. Um, yeah. Glad to hear it. So yeah, everyone, stop uh, stop panic buying fuel. There's no reason to, because that's how you go and create uh, an artificial shortage. Same way as with uh, creating artificial toilet paper shortage, which there never was a shortage of, and there's never going to be a shortage of, no matter what some people may try to tell you. Yeah, well, that's even often you, says. Well, as I say, simply if you manufacture something on a certain level and you have an extensive amount of people go after it at the same time, then you try and replenish said thing, and you run run out because so many people have. Yeah, it's just a. It's I can see where it's going to happen. It's going to happen again mm-hmm. here when they announce more shutdowns because as Norway is opening up, other places are shutting down again more. So. Yeah. And it's yeah, not just opening up, it's like completely opened up as an end of all restrictions, including social distancing. Yay! <laughs> Good. Yeah, I'd yeah, like to hope yeah. it's something that'll spread and fucking everybody else will start doing it. But yeah, I don't. well, it's a good experiment. So we'll see how it works. Uh, oh, don't call so it that or Simi Lou might well, get mad at you. Hmm? Don't say it like that or Simi Lou might get mad at you. Oh, I'm, well, he's probably mad at me anyway. I'm like a little bit disappointed that he didn't include us in his uh, in his tweet with Man, uh, all those uh, after, failures. Uh, but, no, that's like we, we didn't predict any failure. So, yeah, there was that. Uh, but anyway, Stephen Orton after, says, yeah. Hail Andre, Tom, Script, Mr. H, Wrenches, and Chat. Hoping everyone is safe and healthy. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think we are for the most part. And Mr. Tickletrunk says, Mr. H, I thought you let Andre fall off a tall building at Christmas. Oh, wait, that was Die Hard. I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, Martin Beck Trusbach says for 50 Danish krona, so doing two times now in the cinema. Not woke at all. Best movie since the first Lord of the Rings film. I am over the dunes on this movie. All right, cool. Well, well it sounds uh, like you're not the only one. Yeah, like you've now all heard the hype and everything. So, so uh, Tom, Script, and Mr. H, are you not dying that you have to wait another three weeks before you get to, get to see it? Yeah, I want to see it. I am. Um, I'm very disappointed um, that they've done the release the way they have. I don't really understand it with the UK. A little bit frustrating, to be honest. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's really like I've like it worked out for me because I saw it uh, the day before it was like opened in the markets where it did open. Mm. So I'm not complaining in that sense, but but still, I think it's completely hopeless that they have had like this long drawn out thing with some select markets five weeks mm. or forty five days, as Thomas would pointed out before the rest of the uh, the worldwide release and then the rest of that release is at the same time as the hbo max release yeah. which kind of is going to undercut that hbo max uh, or the, the, the theatrical release everywhere else because that means that even if you don't have hbo max there's going to be a 4k quality version available out there on the high seas now, how do we think uh, that's going to uh, to affect uh, affect the movie's uh, box office? Variety doesn't think it's going to do any wonders, at least. Tom, what's the story here? Well, as we've been pointing out for a while, this is not a good move. And finally, the mainstream media has hopped on board along with that, says Dune is opening in movie theaters and your living room. Here's why that's a mistake, going, according to uh, Owen Gleiberman, who's actually... Uh, Somebody I'm not used to seeing too many uh, articles from, but he's a uh, he's been in the involved in the Hollywood business for quite a few years. Uh, Dune has the potential to be the biggest of the year, but however, well, it does or does not do at the box office is undeniably the biggest, grandest slice 
of movie in long time, big in as in vast, as in images and sounds that fill the screen and fill fill the senses. Big as in the movie transports you to a desert planet of Arrakis for two hours and thirty five minutes, and you live there. So why would this overwhelming, epic, visually spectacular, one of a kind sci fi popcorn movie be opening on October twenty second on a television set near you? We know the answer, and there's kind of petty spreadsheet logic to it. Dune is opening simultaneously in theaters and on home screens because Warner Brothers and the company that Wikipedia now describes as an American diversified multinational mass media and entertainment conglomerate. That's a lot of fucking titles. <laughs> uh, also owns HBO Max, the streaming service where Dune will be available for no extra cost to subscribers. Warner Brothers is owned by AT&T and will be merging probably next year with Discovery. The revamped company will have many interlocking priorities in the first year of the pandemic, which was the year of HBO Max's ostensibly game-changing launch. I don't know about that. It became a transcendent corporate goal for Warner Brothers to do it all to do all it could to put the new streaming service into orbit. And since people for most of the year couldn't go to the movies, it was decided that each of the studio's 2021 films would be made available the same day it's released in theaters. Now, I could have said that to you in like two sentences instead of ten. Um, but yeah, like Owen just basically goes on here uh, to talk about uh, basically how what we've been saying is that they're not going to make the kind of money. I'm not going to read this whole fucking thing right now. <laughs> this is way too long. Uh, but he's got a few reasons here. Uh, the film will be less profitable. If Dune opens with $50 million, it will be clear that the studio left a lot of money on the table, especially if grosses seriously decline in the weeks ahead. The movie has already opened international markets exclusively in theaters where it is doing well, but using domestic take as a yardstick, let's, let's say it winds up matching Shang-Chi total receipts, which are closing in on $200 million. That sounds like a lot of money, but this is Dune we're talking about. It's being marketed as the new Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings. It should be far and away the biggest movie of the year. All right, so let's let's start there. We already know this is the case. This is what we've been saying for a while. The movie's going to be less profitable. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right, Mr. H? Say that again, sorry. The movie being less profitable. I mean, that's a given, isn't it? Of course well, right, yeah, like this is yeah. dumb. Like, it's just, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's, it's going to be less profitable just because there's going to be more people in one room watching it rather, you know, for the price of a monthly um you know monthly subscription rather than an actual ticket sale i mean just that alone just that alone disregarding any of the potential piracy that's going to happen i mean fucking einstein's god it's mental really right and i mean i i don't know i'm sure you heard that uh, uh black widow became the quickly became the mm. highest pirated film of all time real quick oh that's going to be replaced pretty quickly i think I think oh, you're 100%. right. June, June will, will be... But the thing is, like, I think people that really like it will still probably end up going to the cinema as well. Like, I, I, I do think that. Like, you know, there are people that will go, oh, that was good. I'll, I'll actually pay to go and watch that now. Um, not admittedly, not a lot, but there will be some people that do. Yeah. And I mean, and I, I said this last week too, as far as, you know, People, it seems like people actually want to see this movie, and I've been saying it for a while, and uh, I, I'm not surprised at how much it's doing overseas, but I'm glad to see that. But I feel like uh, that we're wasting time and momentum by waiting so long. I uh, agree completely. But I'm sure he'll get into that as well here, unless uh, you guys have anything more to say about outside of the obvious one here. We all knew that. Uh, let's get into a second reason here. Otherwise, making do a day and date, doing a day and date release radically cuts down the film's event status. This is another point we've been saying about these movies. Um, I don't even think we need to get into this paragraph. It's pretty much said right there in the in the title. Uh, I've been saying this for a while. This is a stip, This is kind of a, a an issue we kept running to when I worked in video. Is if you had a movie that was straight to video, of course nobody wanted to see it, or they didn't. Uh, regarded as highly uh, sought after as a movie that was in theaters. I mean, they would do everything they could in the advertisements they're selling just to make sure you knew that this movie was in theaters, even if it was in Tucson for one day. You know, like, they, they would still say it was in theaters. So I think that means a lot. I mean, 
uh, how what is it does it mean it's like anything over there mr h as far as like uh do they have stigmas to movies if they're straight to video oh yeah no people think they're shit that they go straight to video normally yeah but it's different like yeah no yeah it's still the same stigma it is still the same stigma yeah script anything to add to that well, yeah, I mean, we, we grew up on the on the habit that we would go see something in theaters and then later it would come out on physical media. When you don't have that theatrical opportunity, it's like, oh, is this like a TV movie or a TV show or doesn't didn't have the uh, it wasn't a good enough quality to be distributed throughout theaters. So it must already be bad. And that tends to be the case more often than not, sadly. And with um, the digital realm kind of replacing that part of the physical media, I guess that stigma is kind of trans transferred right. over to to that area. No, it's straight Honestly, streaming. I think it's gotten worse because right now, like, there are so many streaming servers that are flooded with with so much crap, with so many made for streaming movies that never ever would have gotten a theatrical release, and some of those are of like really spotty technical quality as well. Like, you can tell that these are made for extremely low budget, and uh, and that is something that also gives like some level of stigma to to direct to streaming now i don't think that dune is something that's going to be affected by that per se what i do think though is that in having five weeks of an exclusive release theatrical release in some very few limited markets around the world before it's dropped everywhere else at essentially the same time as hbo max I mean, all momentum is going to be lost. Like, people want to see it, like, now. And I think that people were more keen to see it last week than they are this week. Because, like, now anticipation is going to be gone by the time it actually does come out in the rest of the world, including North America and the UK. My worry is the whole movie is going to feel like old news, even though you haven't seen yeah. it. It's going to feel like, oh, that was a movie that was, like, in theaters two months ago. But I didn't bother seeing it then. And since I didn't bother seeing it then, it evidently wasn't that important. So I'm not going to see it now either. And, and then people have forgotten that they couldn't go see it because it wasn't out in their market. They just know that it was out and they didn't go see it. Yeah. And then like all sense of like urgency is lost. I mean, that, that's a great way of making it. One of those movies that you know that you probably should see, but you didn't get to see and it's not a big deal. Yeah, it feels like a passive release as opposed to something, as you said, with urgency, with that, with um, acti activity involved. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll get the advertisements of this is a must see in theaters, but it's not going to really have the impact because the option of it also being on streaming is is there to uh, usurp such a thing. Exactly. Well, plus, you know, plus, I think it's really, really important that you kind of feel feel that like you're done with it already in a way. It's something that's come and gone. Well, and I'll go one step further is it actually is more detrimental than it used to be because as we keep pointing out here on these shows, uh, like how Disney has devalued all their, their, their movies because now that they're all on a streaming service, they're just content. Bambi is worth no more than Little Mermaid 3, which is worth no more than, you know, their remake of Lady and the Tramp. It's all just the same now because it's just content filling up a streaming service and it, it, there's nothing really making it stand out. So outside of losing that momentum and all the things you guys just said, which I agree with, I think it's even more detrimental to the film overall, because if you throw that up on, on streaming, here we go. Okay. You guys just said the momentum leaves. Well, normally people are used to a movie only being in theaters a couple months and then being on streaming, which is basically going to happen here with Dune. So I already know a few people who went and bought their tickets thinking it was coming out already, and they're like, oh, don't come out till October. What the fuck? You know, so you're going to get a lot of people who are just going to watch it on HBO Max thinking, oh, it's been out for a while and I'm just finally getting around to it. Or again, like it's just, it doesn't have that urgency to it. It doesn't, it won't have that, uh, that feeling. I, I mean, Owen's right here. I, it's going to lose a lot of its gusto, I believe if it weren't on HBO Max at the same time. So, I don't know. I, I think it's going to really mess up this movie's how it's viewed in the future. I don't know. I think it could. I don't know. Maybe I'm being hyperbolic. But. Yeah, no, I don't think you're wrong, because there's like the thing that when 
uh, when the when history makes its judge, judgment, it only looks at the numbers themselves, and that's it. Like for instance, we go right now and we talk about a movie that came out 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. All we talk about is what it made. All context, context is kind of like lost. What it was up against is lost. Uh, if something extraordinary happened that would have affected the box office, also lost. And so, like, history remembers only the hard numbers where box office is concerned. Right. Um, well, this next point, I think, is kind of Owen showing his age a little bit. It says it's going to play on TV a lot less, and it brings up space, uh, 2001 of Space Odyssey and talking about how small television is. Like, here's the difference, though, Owen. The average TV is a lot bigger than it used to be when 2001 came out. So, I mean, I think this is kind of a non-point on that one. So, I think we're going to skip over that unless somebody else wants to. Well, doesn't that also uh, preclude the um, idea that maybe it would be better for some people to watch it at home if they have a bigger screen television? Yeah, I think this was one point he should have overlooked and just moved on because this is just his age kind of showing through, I think. Well, this is also something that the editor uh, should have... Uh... Uh, should have caught before publishing, which only goes to show lacking so quality control in variety. Is all yeah. I can take from that. I mean, oh, no, no, it's actually quite a good article from Variety. No, no, yeah. I mean, I'm glad to see this article. I'm not trying to like dig on it or anything, <clears> but <throat> I just know who Owen Gleiberman is, not personally, but like I, I'm just kind of, I think it's funny that he points out this whole thing about 16 inch black and white TVs. It's like, my man, ain't nobody had a 16 inch black and white TV for 40 years. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think that's the problem. The problem here isn't so much that as I think it's just taking away from its, you know, its urgency, as Andre said, I think was the best way to put it. Uh, right. The entire industry is vested their interest in the success of Dune. I don't know about the entire industry, but uh, I know Warner Brothers has put a lot into this. Um, and not only that, they're they're using it as a loss leader. But let's see what he has to say here. It used to be uh, that if a major movie turned out to be a commercial disappointment, the only people who suffered were the ones connected to it, including the executives at the studio. In the rest of the industry, there was schadenfreude. But thanks to karmic double whammy of the streaming revolution and the pandemic, the world is suddenly asking if movies and theaters have a future. I think they do. Of but it's not. Do. Yeah, but it's not foregone. And part of it is that we need to see the enthusiasm of movie theater audiences to be reminded of the potent force they are. Last summer, Tenant was supposed to be the movie that jump-started movie going for various reasons, notably stubbornness of the pandemic. That didn't work out so well, but movies in the last six months have indeed jump-started, and that makes Dune the right movie at the right time. It's a film that could remind us of the primacy and profitability of the theater experience. You wouldn't want every movie to be like Dune, but you want Dune to be Dune. If it turns into a commercially compromised, lagging version of itself, that becomes a gigantic blown opportunity and everyone suffers. Okay, I get what he's saying here. But you were you were kind of making uh, a few comments there, Mr. H. So let's 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 let you uh, dive into this one first. Uh, my computer has seemingly froze. Oh no. <laughs> sorry no that's uh, right. can you can you repeat that all again because my computer's absolutely had a shit fit so um well the, the short version is is he's he's saying that the industry is kind of really invested heavily in how dune plays mm -hmm. uh especially after the pandemic and you know you pointed out like, they're invested in how dune plays yeah i mean i guess they are to a certain degree i mean let, let, let's take a look at uh sh you know uh, shang chi for instance right like a lot of people um you know, the, let, let's 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 uh, disregard for one instance, uh, just for the case of this point anyway, and how the industry reacts to things. Let's disregard any thoughts of whether you know there were seats that were bought or anything like that. Not important. The situation lies with Shang Chi is that it you know did relatively well, um, or the industry reacted to it doing what they perceive to be relatively well, right? That's a fact. Why? Because at its opening weekend and then instantly Venom's um, release date was moved up after it had already been delayed. So there are movies which have been reacting to 
um, you know, that sort of, you know, studios have been reacting to movies that are succeeding. Now, Dune is a movie that they are anticipating to massively succeed. So if it does, you know, massively succeed, um, but it's interesting as well, because I think Bond releases before Dune anyway. Um, so there'll be two movies in the UK that will, I'm pretty certain it releases before Dune. I so think anyway, it's two weeks before or a week before. Yeah. yeah. So there'll be two movies that the industry are going to hugely look at now. All eyes will be on Bond and Dune because um, they want them to succeed. You know, they I mean, I've done some, I've done some live streams talking about supposed Bond mania and all this kind of stuff. I don't personally see it. Um, but the industry is is hoping and praying that these movies do really, really well. They absolutely are. Um, so them looking to react to it and things like that, they do have a vested interest in it. Um, like without a shadow of a doubt, like, uh, you know, it, how are you ever going to convince financiers to do $200 uh, million dollar movies again after the pandemic if none of these movies do well? That's a very good point. You're not, not going to be able to do it, are you? So, of course, every studio is going to look at it and go, yeah, no, we need this to do really well. Andre, script anything to say to that? Well, they script has been quiet, so yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking it from like the producer's angle, which is they're going to be watching a lot of the tentpole films because they need to establish what an audience pattern is going to be. Where are they going to be finding the most eyes on their product, and how can they monetize that as best as possible for the, yeah. the financing purposes? So yeah, we're going to be looking at Bond, we're going to be looking at Dune, we're going to be looking at Ghostbusters, we're going to be looking at the Eternals. All of this is going to be used to, to figure out the pattern of what is our audience is actually willing to leave mm. their home to see uh, these uh, these films in theaters, or do they just prefer to stay in? And if so, then we have to start reevaluating our budgets and our marketing strategy to cater to the the preferences of the majority of the audience or potential audience, actually. Yeah. Andre? Yeah, no, obviously. One thing is uh, that they, uh, they they have to assess where things are, but also I think, um, as Mr. Rage pointed out, that it's something that gives an indication of where the threshold is. Like, yeah, you're probably going to have a hard time getting financiers to get behind $200 million movies for a very long time. But what's the upper range? How far can they go? What kind of expense can you justify in this climate? The more money these movies are able to, to make, the more they can argue that this is the kind of money that we can spend. This is what you need to cough up. Cough up. Mm. Because of their worst case scenario is that it all bumps and they're basically stuck to TV budgets going forward. That could happen, mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, I see another side of this too. And as far as the Bond mania thing, Dr. Dave, yeah, I'm kind of with Mr. H. I don't see a mania. I see a lot of people that are very worried about this oh, movie. Honestly, I, I did a live stream on it talking about yeah. it all going through, going through some various articles. And it was a Guardian article. And they were like, we, you know, they had the heads of um, cinemas coming in saying we've hired, you know, an extra 450 people just to deal with Bond mania. And I'm like, what fucking Bond mania? Right. Like, what are you joking? Like, is, has this been... You know, has this been uh, cast down from Yon High, like from Barbara Broccoli going, shit, we need to, you know, or, or even, you know, MGM going, right, we need to sort this out. We need to try and get some buzz going. Like, let's generate some artificial hype here. Let's get a, plant this story in the news. I don't know. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, well, there is MGM, no... MGM, they really only have an investment in the U.S. Outside the U.S., it's Universal who's distributing it. Yeah, well, again, uh, well, yeah, but these articles go worldwide as well. Right? True, like, but people will be watching it going, "Oh, Bond Mania." Oh, okay. I mean, it's well, all nonsense it... anyway. Like, I just don't see it. And and I reviewed yeah. some of the old trailers as well. I was like, you know, because people, people, like people keep poo pooing June, right? People are like, "Ah, oh, June's going to be shit." And I and I compared both trailers because they both came out a year ago, right? You know, like Bond had like twenty million views. June's got like thirty four million views. Yeah. You know, like if there's ever, if, if, you know, if we're led to believe that June's going to be crap, well, Bond may, Bond, Bond's going to be even worse then, right? Like, you know, if you're comparing it on, uh, you know, the, the sort of metrics of what people are searching for, you know, and what people are watching and things like that. Like if I do a video on June, it blows up. People are yeah. really interested in June. Well, you know? I know it's the difference. It's the same as you guys. Any video you do is a, is a, is a cross section, right? Like it's a, it's a cross section. It's a mini census on, you know, on what people are interested in, what gets more views, whether it's good or bad, right? Well, there you go. That's where the interest lies. Well, even that aside, I noticed that it was outpacing the Batman trailer, which it had been out already yeah. a month when yeah. it had the Dune trailer dropped. And yeah, like 
I think the bigger thing here is with Bond, at least to 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 finish up that part of the, the the discussion. I think the bigger part here is they've already had to publicly say that they know they have to make over nine hundred million just to break even. I mean, that's just mental. Like it's a billion dollar movie, and it hasn't even it, it has no way of making that kind of money now. It's so stupid. So it's, stupid. And I think why, Dude why coming out so close to it is going to kill it. I don't think anybody cares. That's what I mean. Yeah, the, where's the hype for Bond? Like, I don't where is see the hype aside from looking to you know the oh it sounds like shit. Like that's where the hype is. People saying it sounds like crap. Exactly. But anyway, so yeah, like going going back to the point of the article, yeah, the industry absolutely has a vested interest in the success of Dune, and as well, like you you better believe all studios are going to be looking at that and going right, this is the next big thing, sci-fi. Let's go, sci-fi epics. Let's go. Hundred percent, they will be. Just well, like they do oh, yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. And the other side of this that I was going to get to, as I see here, is as far as the industry goes as a whole, I think they're more or less just pissy because mm -hmm. you've had two of the two or three of the biggest what could have been potential hits of the year mm -hmm. that got snuffed out because of the streaming bullshit, right? So I see the other side of it where people are like, you know, you've ruined the idea of going to the movies and these movies that could have been perceived as hits. I mean, look how hardcore they are trying to make Shang Chi out to be a hit. Right, yeah. they're trying so fucking hard, and let's be real. I've got into a few discussions and arguments with a few YouTubers and shit on whether or not it's going to be profitable. But the fact that we have to argue about that to me tells me is like, really, is it going to be all that fucking profitable? Because the movie costs 150 million dollars, even if they didn't spend as much on it advertising as they normally do these movies. I mean, even if you figure they got to double their 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 the amount of money to be in the profit range, they're still not there really. They're barely yeah. there. So, yeah. like, I was figuring around, more around 400 million to break even. Some people say in the three lower 300 range, but I'm like, I don't know about that. Uh, again, I don't see this, the uh, Shang-Chi being financially successful. The only few movies we've had this year that you consider even remotely financially successful have been basically outside of the movies that were released before the pandemic is basically Kong versus Godzilla. Mm hmm. Which was also on streaming at the same time, which says something, and that's why I'm saying this is because I feel like they're they're pointing this out is like you you ruined the the potential of that film and the potential you know idea that people were going back to movies by putting it on streaming, same exact time, you know the other one would be Fast Nine that one actually got a theatrical release, and it did fairly well, didn't do as well as it could have, but it did fairly well considering, and then maybe the only other one arguably, um was the other one that ate the the uh, shit uh i just had it in my head and i forgot it but anyway there hasn't been that many but black widow could have been profitable possibly because if you look at the way it played i think that that's another reason why the, we're at the situation where everybody's like what is what is the future of this streaming thing going to do to movies right i yeah. think you're you're breaking the habit uh when people get the idea that oh i don't have to worry about going to the movie theaters you know, people are talking about Free Guy. It's not a huge hit, but people are still talking about it because you can only see it in theaters. Yeah, and well, in fact, I, I watched Free Guy. It was good, dumb fun. I enjoyed it. Should have thought it was. I mean, it's, it's not going to be hugely profitable, but it's going to do okay in comparison, probably, than, than it would have if they just dropped it on streaming. Because yeah, that's I'm the other sure. thing is, it, how 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 much of a loss leader for for HBO Max is this really worth to them? I mean, it, but this is this is what I don't understand, and I said in my my video earlier today was that I don't understand how HBO Max is the decider on whether Legendary go and make another Dune movie. What? It, Warner Brothers has only put up 25% anyway. So how is the HBO Max the, how, how has that got anything to do with Legendary putting up another 75% for Dune 2? How? Like, can anyone explain that to me? Because I don't fucking understand. I've got Contract. no idea. Contracts. It depends on the contracts yeah. because if uh, if Warner uh, owns uh, a twenty five percent stake in that movie and they have twenty five percent say on whether or not there is a sequel, you yeah, can do a hell of a lot of green lighting or sabotage with that no. uh, with that twenty five percent. Lest of course, uh, legendary were to buy them out. But I think it's far more likely that, uh, and this is what has been indicated already. That if it does well on HBO Max, 
then they're going to want to continue on HBO Max at the very least, right. uh, pending uh, pending exactly how things uh, progress and how much it earns and everything like that. I mean, mm. like if it earns well at the box office internationally, that's a good case for well, maybe we actually should do something more than just Mando Tech and put some more money money into it. That's going to be. But I think that there's going to be like some fighting between Legendary and Warner over the future of Tune here. I think everyone is going to want to do it, uh, but um, but uh, what's going to happen? We'll just have to wait and see. I mean, it could also be that uh, for the sequel, they may have more to do with it. Like, I mean, like for instance, the Joker. They farmed a lot of that out as far as the you know. That's why they didn't get as much profit on it. But I think they have much more control over the sequel. And I've seen this usually in other situations where they have much more sway over the sequel because the studio has more power in the, in that situation. So again, I think Andre's right. It has everything to do with how the contracts are laid out, and maybe it's more. Maybe maybe Warner has the opportunity to put more into the sequel or has more sway on the sequel. Who knows? There's also the aspect of um, what like the tracking and rating of what the customers who subscribe to HBO Max do. So let's say. Once it is released on HBO Max and they get a subscriber boost, they can see not only did they subscribe, but what was the first thing that they clicked on to watch. And if that tracks as Dune, then that shows a positive relationship with regards to the content of the film to yeah, HBO true. Max as well. And that might also factor in and also might have maybe they will be able to negotiate in a sequel for Dune, a, a bump for Legendary and the cast and crew and production involved if they're able to confirm that yeah we have a pattern here when we when we release dune on hbo max yes our existing subscribers watch it but on top of that all the additional subscribers we have the first thing they clicked on was dune and then they started to uh watch all the other co uh, other con uh, content therefore they amortized dune to have actually increase uh, their holding of customers uh to the subscription service which means that dune would then be considered a higher priority, not just for HBO Max, but also for the investment required for a follow-up film. So, I mean, it's all up in the air at this point. Uh, some people like to call it the wild, wild west, but at the same time, there's so much detailed information they can get through streaming uh, that it allows them to get a clear picture of what is in their best interest uh, overall. And if they are going to in integrate those third-party production companies like a Legendary, um, Legendary has to start negotiating better um, so that they can, you know, justify to themselves. Yeah, we're going to put seventy-five percent of a two hundred million dollar budget in a sequel for for Dune. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what I'm saying. Is like, yeah, maybe they only have a twenty-five percent investment in this first movie, but you know, they may have more of an investment in a in a sequel happening. That's yeah. that yeah. has everything to do with contracts. So, yeah. Um, and then I guess I, there was more to this that I didn't get to. Uh, of course, there's another possibility in all this. Dune opens on October twenty-second. People watching it. On HBO Max, and still goes on the massive theatrical, and it still goes on to be a massive theatrical hit. It breaks the bank. That could be a happy ending, one that might help rewrite the rules of what's coming. But I'm not holding my breath, and that's the actual end of the entire article. So, I think there's a few other points he might be missing out on, but I, he's not wrong here. And, and I, like you, Mr. H, I'm glad to see uh, a, a publication like Variety has an article like this out there, kind of. I don't know, I guess slapping Hollywood on the wrist a little bit and saying, no, you're being bad here. <laughs> like, Because, I mean, we said this a while ago. What was that? Sorry. It's pressure, isn't it? You know? It's yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, because, I mean, a, a year ago, everybody's like, oh, theaters are dead. Theaters are dead. We're done. We're not going no more. And, I mean, I still hear this from some people, but I feel like it's in, in larger areas because it's like, I don't know if they realize that the theaters have been open this entire time in the Midwest and certain other places. They never really closed. I mean, he put, but like, clearly there had to be enough theaters open for some of the movies to make the money they have. So uh, I don't know. I, I think you're on, onto something. I think it's like a, a very, very uh, U.S. centric point of view. And it's like you speak from the point of view of exactly where you are and what you see around you. Like, for instance, here, Dune was packed when I first went to see it. And from what I hear, it's even more packed than packed now, because now you actually can fill theaters to capacity, which you couldn't before. Then you had, like, the COVID restrictions. They're gone now. So, um, so yeah, I, the theaters aren't going anywhere. 
it seems that for the right movie, people absolutely will come back. That is true. It's, well, especially in, in your parts of the world, uh, over here in North America, we're actually getting some restrictions on October 22nd, <laughs> like are being composed. So for instance, there's the, this, the talk of the passport thing, which um, is already in effect in, in places like in Quebec. It will be in effect on the day Dune releases in Ontario. Um, and in other provinces across Canada and also in some areas of the United States. And that's going to have an impact because, again, um, those passes are specific to non-essential um, businesses and operations. And nothing is, unfortunately, uh, considered more non-essential than theater going. So that could have an impact as well. There could be a lot of people that want to see it in the theater, but just might be denied because of whatever personal reason they, they have. And justifiably so, they should have those personal reasons. It's I don't like the compulsion of that. Aspect. Yeah, if they don't have the sufficient social credit score, then yeah, exactly, and, and that's something also. I mean, if, if I were like far more important in Hollywood, I would totally be lobbying against those types of things because it's like you are in, directly impacting my ability to be successful because you're uh, excluding customers based on immutable um, things that you're claiming as a, as a choice when it's really a, a, a compulsion. And it's like, how, how can I hit my broadest customer base if you're telling my, my customers that they can't see the thing I've made for them? And I think I think the industry should have should be doing that. I think a lot of industries and businesses should be doing that in, in response to such a thing. Yeah, absolutely. But um, instead, many appear to be fighting against their own interests. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's really it's a little tragic, too. But I'm I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to see Dune in theaters, um, and I hope anyone else who wants to does as well, because it, it's it, this is a movie that a lot of people have been anticipating, and not just because the the only options they've seen were the sci-fi miniseries and the uh, David Lynch film, but because you know a lot of people enjoyed Blade Runner twenty forty nine, uh, not enough for it to be a huge huge success, but enough for it to still be in the conversation. And the same with Arrival, so they like the director, they like the cast. Uh, the script was pretty solid, so I'm, I'm curious to see the differences between script to screen. And um, yeah, so we'll have to wait and see, unfortunately. I got to wait another four, four and a half weeks. <laughs> yeah. Actually, on that note, I, I reread the script, looking forward to, to that myself. Uh, and I can ask you right now what the difference, uh, difference is. Great. <laughs> yeah. The only real difference is that every single reference to past history and to the lore of the Dune universe is gone from the movie. Wow. Huh. Every single thing. The only like missing scene is like the, you know, chess scene between Piter and, uh, and uh, uh, what's his name again? Tufir Havat. Oh. Yeah, that was okay. one of my favorite scenes in the script. That ain't there either. So it's that, and uh, it's the, um, it's all the world building and establishing history scenes. Every single reference to the Machine Crusade is gone, which I think sucked. But um, if that's what it takes to make the movie clearer to to first time watchers, then yeah, evidently it worked. Yeah, maybe they're going to save it for... I mean, I'm really hoping they do get the, to do the Sisterhood of the Bene Gesserit show. Um, yeah, yeah, that is uh, being developed, so I would imagine that they will. Yeah, well, it's had a couple of hiccups because of that pandemic, because my understanding was that it was supposed to be launched concurrently with the first Dune film. Yeah, it was, but it got a new showrunner now recently, so it's obviously like at least at least a year delayed. But at maybe least, yeah, at the very minimum, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but now it has a new showrunner, uh, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, I personally, I would imagine a showrunner name only. But um, on the streaming side of things, possibly. I, I mean, again, it depends on because uh, it's for an HBO Max, and I don't know all the details of their of the how they run their shows yet because not a whole lot of people have been talking about that. Disney side of things, it's clear as day how they're doing operations over there. Yeah, how are they doing operations over there? Yeah, you're you're pretty much your showrunners in name only. There's um, executive producers that are traditionally known as directors and only do directing that are that are getting executive producer credits, that are getting writing credits, even though they're not really writing. It's it's quite bizarre over at Disney. And this isn't just across their Marvel shows or their Star Wars shows. This is also across 
uh, things like Turner and Hooch, um, like the Doogie Hauser remake and, and so forth and all these other little uh, properties that they have. So it's really interesting to see that they have a, a very different approach to how they're doing their streaming um, format uh, than what we would traditionally understand for, for television. When you say show, showrunner and name only, just as I speculate is the case with um, with uh, with the new Dune showrunner on HBO Max, or like the Dune Sisterhood series, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, do we do? Can we ever tell in the credits hidden who is like the the real showrunner in practice, if not in title? Um, I would probably take it on habitually who is the director for every episode. Um. So, for instance, you have like the so Marvel if it's edit. one director for every episode, then that's the real. The hood, yeah, the I think you have a genre. series. I think with the with the, some of the streaming services, the series is directed by the same person for a majority of the episodes. Um, in some case, uh, and so that would be considered the showrunner, and then the the the, the high next tier executive producer, usually the person who who the show is says is created by, would be the traditionally the original showrunner, ideally. And they'd be working in close quarters with um, the series director, and it's, it's a weird relationship. I'm still trying to figure out other other details onto it, but even some of the people that I know that uh, work in those rooms don't quite understand everything. They're just given their assignments, they break their story, they turn in their scripts, uh, and then they're kind of figuring it out as they go. Um, and it's different from show to show, but the overall understanding is that yeah, you have a series director who is pretty much leading and driving the show, and then who would be the considered the showrunner in a normal television set setting is there to help the director. Well, uh, we, we uh, actually have to say goodbye to Mr. H. It looks like he has to run. Thank you for being here this morning, though. We appreciate you uh, hanging yeah, out with absolutely. us. Yeah, sorry, guys. Absolutely. Something's come up, unfortunately. A little bit of a personal issue I do need to go and take care of, so I do apologize. No that. worries. Yeah. Hopefully everything's okay. And uh... Well, yeah, we, we shall see. But no, I do appreciate it. Thank you for having me, as always. Do appreciate no, absolutely. It. You're always welcome. Uh, always good to 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 have, to have our beef out in public. <laughs> <where. Quite laughs> yeah. well, I'll do it in public, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the doctor will have to like, pry you apart. You guys don't knock it off. Well, I know, yeah. I know. Just you know, it's just going at one another, isn't it? It's awful. That's dreadful. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry to bring the stream down with that. You know that beef. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Calm as, soon down. As, as soon as it's possible, I'll get, head on over to the UK and I'll I'll bring some bottles of moonshine to smash your head with. And stuff Absolutely, you know? <laughs> appreciate it. That'd be great. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, take, all care. Right, take, take care. care. Take, take care. Bye. Do check out his channel, of course. Uh, yes, with that, the link is in should, the description, uh, and also check out Script uh, Doctor's channel. His link yes. is also in the description. I think we should check out some super chats in the meantime. Yes, we let's do to. that. Uh, let's first see if there's some that we can bring up on screen, and then we'll we'll get into those before we move on. Nope, there's none that I can bring up on screen, but 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 we have them all behind here. Um. So uh, today, then we had, uh, and we had a couple of uh, from from Mister Tickle Drunk, uh, and then we have John Apocalypse who wonders for for a pound seventy nine box office predictions for Venom and Bond. Yeah, I, I don't know the details of the markets they're going to open in, so I'm not going to give any kind of predictions. Uh, you guys feel the feel the the urge and challenge for that. At least twenty five million opening weekend. That would be the the kind of like the average that we're seeing for any film. Uh, that's the minimum, I would say. Probably almost guarantee it. I'd be surprised if it ever got lower, but I would not be surprised if it got higher. But uh, yeah. that's that's kind of the pattern I've been seeing. Yeah, yeah. Tom, any thoughts? Um, for Bond. I'm only going to give the U.S. prediction. I'm going to say for uh, Bond, it's going to open in the 30 to $40 million range. Venom, probably in that 60 70 All right. Yeah. All right. I think yeah, that's that... entirely feasible, yeah. yeah. Uh, that uh, seems uh, exceedingly plausible, uh, if you ask me. Although I'm not going to predict I'll anything myself that seems uh, seems pretty pretty myself. fair yeah 
And Mr. Tickles Rock says for two Canadian dollars, always glad my fellow Canadian is here today. And yes, so are we. <laughs> and oh, Kaiju King Gabriel said for five dollars, there's no way the Eagles would have made it to Mordor because Sauron had an Air Force himself. Well, the risk of the ring falling into Nazgul hands was high. Ah, oh, so that's the excuse. I would have liked them to say that on screen. That could be feasible uh, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a pretty, pretty decent one. I still wouldn't uh, like to have seen that type of conflict in, <laughs> in Lord of yeah. the Rings. I mean, <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, and then let's see if we got this one. Uh, Hypergyver two says no one will care about all new, all woke spawn. Yeah, we're gonna get into that real soon. Uh, real soon here. Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk wonders, think Dune being half the story will also hurt it? Honestly, no. I do not think that Dune is going to be hurt in the slightest about it only being half the story of the book. If anything, I think that's going to help it. Because honestly, if um, if there was one thing that brought down the original, not the, not the original, but the previous film adaptation of Dune, the David Lynch movie, was that it was the whole story crammed into two-hour running time. And you simply can't do it justice in two-hour running time. If they had split that movie into two as well, as was David Lynch, uh, Lynch's original desire to do, I think that movie wouldn't have been the flop that it was. I think it would have been a hit. Uh and same with this movie here. Yeah, you have people griping that, oh, it wasn't the whole story. Yeah, you know what that means? It means they left wanting more. That's good. Yeah. As opposed to the 1984 movie, the David Lynch movie, where people left confused because they had been overexposed to it, to narrative information. It was just too much. It was too information dense. Here, it has time to breathe. It has time for for director the, the even enough to really show off and say oh look what a great director i am with loads of extravagant shots and extravagant industrial melody free score and stuff like that which is all epic and everything so you can really show off uh without it coming at the expense of the story i mean they even cut out the references to the machine crusade which i think is horrible but um but yeah, no, I don't think that's going to harm the movie at all. Script. I think that um, it's always better for a filmmaker to try and end their story, especially with the the audience's reaction being, ooh, what happens next, as opposed to, that's it. Because I would say that that would be with the David Lynch doom. It's like, you watch and you're like, that's it. And I mean, there's lots of cool visuals to it, um, some decent performances, but you're like, that that's it <laughs> like that's kind of i get that from a lot of the hardcore do fan dune fans so like no there's so much more um and i'm hoping that's what going to be the case for denis even um uh dune for especially for me as like i want to see them i want to see how he does the next chapter i want to be so engaged in the and this part of the storytelling that when i leave the theater i want to be like oh man i can't wait for the next one i mean because that's that's the goal. That's what we want with every film. Even if it's a standalone film, you kind of want the audience to think of like, I want another story with these characters. Um, that That's always a good uh, marker of success. Um, not, not not just with the financials, but just with your audience, because they're the ones that are giving you those financials in exchange. Yeah, and uh, Tom had to leave him a title here. Are you back, Tom? I yeah, I'm that... here. Oh, okay, yeah, any thoughts on that? Uh, was it a mistake for Dune to cut to, to only show basically half the story of the book? Is that going to hurt it with audiences? Should they have crammed the entirety of the book into the running time? I don't think so. I think uh, I think we're in a world now where we're used to the idea of things like Lord of the Rings, Hunger Games, Harry Potter, you know, stories that have kind of open ends, even the Marvel Universe to a point. Uh, I don't think that's the problem overall. I don't think that or it's going to be a problem. I think the bigger problem is just going to be Warner and Legendary justifying spending the kind of money they did on the first part on the rest of the series. Well, hopefully they won't have to. I mean, you don't have to go back to Caladan. Uh, you've already established much of the city. 
I mean, I can see ways where you can continue the story in a way that where it feels organic, where you don't have to go quite uh, quite as epic as it was necessary to do this time. But yeah, we'll see what they do. Hopefully, they won't scale it back too much. And that is the plan. The epicness was a big part of the experience. Uh, Dingo says Dune should have been three movies at least. Yeah, that's uh, the plan. Um, that is the plan. Yeah, yeah. So if it goes to. <laughs> If it actually comes to fruition, then we'll see. Yeah. Um, I, I have high hopes for it. Uh, every time I hear more about it, see more trailers behind the scenes, I want to see it more. It's slowly becoming more anticipated by me. I mean, Ghostbusters and was probably like my big movie I wanted to see this year, but I mean, I'm starting to, you know, get a little bit more antsy about Dune. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm not alone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then uh, we have Organic Vistas, who said for $4.99, buying seats for Sopranos and Dune. Not sure about Bond. Can't support Woke. They torched it, possibly. Ain't supporting Shang-Chi due to actor slash kids. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fair. And Troy Poselli says, Mr. H understated it. Fans will pay and multiple times because we want to assure a sequel. Uh, Kevin Nelson, uh, yeah, that's a good, good point, but it takes a hell, hell of a lot of fans to assure a sequel. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Nelson says for £20, thank you so much. I'm thinking that these companies just don't want to make any money. Uh, well, they, I'm sure they want to, but they have... Very weird ways of achieving it sometimes. Yeah, that's... I mean, they definitely don't want to spend money, but um, that's for sure. But yeah, they definitely want to make money, and their, yeah. their their perception on how to do that has been very peculiar, in my opinion. Yeah, and um, here's a good a good question, or implication at least. Martin Beck Trusbach says for 50 Danish krona. Warner Brothers assured Villeneuve a sequel will be greenlit as long as the film performs well on HBO Max. I'll believe it when I see it. Script. Do you share Martin Bechtrusbach's cynicism, or do you think that we can trust Warner on this one? Um, I, I think we can probably trust Warner on this because... They're the distrib they're primarily the, the distributor, so they do have the green lighting power in this case because Legendary can front as much of the budget as they want because they're making the film. They just don't have a distribution network, but they, I mean, for for many years they've had a pretty positive relationship with Warner Brothers, not so much with Christopher Nolan's Tenant recently, and obviously there's some controversies with Dune, but I think that Warner Brothers is very confident that the quality of Dune is going to generate good response on HBO Max, and they're basically trying to create a the in order to negotiate the best type of promise and I air quotes that with legendary saying that yes we think this is going to be very very successful on HBO Max so much so that we will promise you a sequel if it does great on HBO Max and I I don't think that theatrical is going to have a negative impact on Warner Brothers uh decision to distribute a, a follow-up film for that and I think that's what they're hoping for and gaining for and that's also kind of a good thing because let's say hypothetically it doesn't perform well in theaters in in north america and um but hbo max it just takes off at least legendary can say well all right we've generated some some money for uh warner brothers through their streaming platform and we didn't make as much in the theaters but at least we're guaranteed uh a sequel which is always a good thing for for a production company because it's like well we're our people are going to be working again on something we have something we know we're going to be working on and I think that could kind of alleviate some some tension, but not a whole lot, because ideally, like their their intention was to have this be a big worldwide opening with a huge box office take and, you know, a nice cultural impact uh, milestone for people. And uh, circumstances have kind of um, uh, dampened on that. So I, I guess this is uh, Warner Brothers trying to circumvent that a little bit. But it, it's a it's a long shot. I think I think Warner Brothers intends and is willing to to put up a sequel and i think they're doing that deliberately by saying like we're going to focus on the hbo max side of things because of the current uh, situations with people getting to theaters i'm sorry for the long-winded part of that but uh yeah just no, uh you're fine uh 
I think Andre had to step away for a second here. So, uh, with that, uh, what else did we have on the docket here? We had... Uh, oh, I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> was it the Spawn thing? Or? Oh, well, yeah. The We all kind of heard about this a while ago. Todd McFarlane's been producing uh, uh, a Spawn film, and he had said something about a while back it was going to be more around this i believe a female protagonist and spawn would be more of a background character and all this shit yeah uh because i read i read the the first draft uh, last year and the, the protagonist was a detective yeah. not, not a female in this in the okay. first draft but I, i'm assuming that was part of the rewrite and what it it was not a very good script it was an interesting take um because it 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 was like a casual it was like todd mcfarlane casually understood um the shadow because the shadow has um has an interest as a similar introduction in his first pulp the, the living shadow where he's that character is not the main character there's this other guy that the shadow has hired to investigate something and we're following him for for most of the book and i think todd mcfarland was trying to recreate that for spawn in the script and i don't think he succeeded very well um and it wasn't like an engaging mystery. I don't remember a whole lot about the script other than the things that it kind of kind of paid homage to from, from other genres and other, other writers. Um, and now we're learning that it's going to have a female lead. It's going to be a bit more of a, of a, a social commentary on current events, uh, which is kind of outside of, of spawn from my understanding. Well, I'm not sure about the female here. I got the story up now. This is where I was stumbling a little. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because Andre, I'm, uh, Andre didn't fucking send me the link. <laughs> I had to go find it. All right. This comes from Bounding. Uh, Todd McFarlane's Spawn film embraces Hollywood wokeness. Uh, Spawn creator Todd McFarlane admitted the upcoming movie will embrace Hollywood wokeness. McFarlane spoke to CBR about the upcoming film. He made it crystal clear the film is about embracing Hollywood's race politics. Last month, it was announced that Brian Tucker is going to take a crack at the movie script. Uh, what about a vision for the project impress you about bringing him on board? Asked CBR. McFarlane answered, well, it wasn't just my decision. There's a handful of other people working on it, and we haven't announced it yet. One of the people working on it that is going to be a big name, we finally get to announce it. I think he said he went through close to 100 scripts by as many people as he could. The creator that I revealed, thought that was interesting. He's like, well, it wasn't just my idea. <laughs> Don't blame me. Uh, then the creator revealed one of the key things he was looking for was a non-white writer. He said, we are looking ideally for someone that could bring a voice to the character on two levels. I'm just a white Canadian kid. I haven't lived the life of a man in America of someone with dark skin. We thought it was important to get perspective of somebody who has. Someone with that perspective coming in and adding slightly different bent to what you and I as comic creators already know as to what Spawn is about, he added. McFarlane then noted that he doesn't want the film to tell Spawn's comic origin. I didn't want it to do the comic book origin story from issue one through three in the movie. We are looking for people without even telling them that to give them a little bit, to give them something a little bit different. He continued, unfortunately, 89, 80 to 90% of them, according to the other person involved who was interviewing the, most of them, we're falling into the trap of retelling the comic book story in the movie. Well, whatever. <laughs> the Spawn creator went on to detail that he wants his new film to be relevant today, specifically in terms of its social content. Didn't he already cast uh, Jamie Foxx in this thing? McFarlane explained, we saw that movie, that movie came out 20 plus years ago from New Line. So what we haven't what haven't we seen that would be interesting and relevant today, both in terms of filmmaking and social content? Really, I don't know about that. What's funny about McFarlane's comments here is that he shoots down the idea of doing Spawn's origin for this upcoming film because it's already been done. But in the next sentence, he's calling for a movie that will real re, be relevant today, both in terms of filmmaking and social content. Not sure if Todd realizes this. But it's been done to the umpteenth time as well. 
We've already seen it, and movie-going audiences are not interested in seeing more. Just look at Terminator Dark Fate, Charlie's Angels, or any of the other films and TV shows that embrace woke culture. Movie-going audiences do not do not want to see films that have social content that is relevant to today. We want messages that are timeless. If you choose relevant to relevant today over timeless, no one remembers your movie the second they are out of theaters. In contrast, timeless messages are still with us. People are still talking about Lord of the Rings and original Star Wars films. People are still talking about Die Hard, Sound of Music, Gone with the Wind, and Wizard of Oz. Farland's comments come as Image Comments comics announced the recently released gunslinger spawn number one became the biggest launch of the new superhero monthly title in the comic industry in the past 25 years and the first printing of 393,000 copies i know king spawn has been doing really well too um was there any more of this that was really even relevant no i think that's a right. that's the main point plus a really really good conclusion if you try to make something really contemporary you just make sure it's not going to age very well no. at all everything that's contemporary ages really badly okay. and those are the things that eventually is going to need a remake yeah and honestly i don't see a problem with doing an origin story spawn is not spider-man spawn is not batman or superman people don't know him as well and they get it granted i know spawn is a very popular character but it wasn't like the 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 nineteen ninety what seven film mm -hmm. was a blockbuster, right? It, it has it's not been very timeless. It's not lived on. The only people I know who still watch it are people like us who actually, you know, are geeks and nerds and maybe the few people who grew up with it. It's not one of those movies that has carried on much past its past due date. Yeah, so, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it is about time you you got to kind of do an origin story here. You I mean, you don't have to you don't have to do the straight up let's tell an origin story, but you at least got to have something in here for a new audience that cuz you have a whole generation of kids who have no fucking clue who Spawn is. Believe me. Possibly. And I, I would also say that when you're dealing with film, you kind of want to like you're introducing the character and in this case, maybe an origin story will work better. I mean, if you want to circumvent an origin story, I would say go to television because you can at least have the characters create the mystery of, of who Spawn is and how he came to be by you know focusing more on the characters and a little bit less on the plot. And that can be engaging enough to hold your audience for the long term where you can actually explore stories like this um, at a better pace. But with a film, you're, you're looking at 90 minutes to two hours that you have to try and get a lot of information in there. So... Do you want to focus more on the, you know, the most important aspect of the character's life, which would be, you know, how they became the the hero that we're seeing them in this film? Or do you want to just give us a like a run of the mill mystery with the character kind of being a little bit more passive, like the title character that is being a little bit more passive and we're focusing on, you know, the non special effects driven, you know, otherwise side character that's that's fueling the story. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of. A lot of things that are peculiar from my perspective as a screenwriter with this direction, given the format. Right. Um, and I mean, Andre, do you think he's saying a lot of this just to appease the media? Do you think? Oh, of really course, it of course. Or... Yeah, no, of course. That's all this is. I mean, just just look uh, into how we've been breaking down the Dune marketing campaign. How half the marketing campaign isn't directed at the audience, but it's directed at the media. It's a huge virtue signal to all the editors and all the uh, all the journalists and all the pundits out there that are completely all in on the you know the cause uh, that they're that they're all behind. And in order to win their favor and get positive press this is the game that they that they now know they have to play they have to virtue signal how like we're with you guys look at our how we use our platform for for social engineering that's what we do so help just like you do want us to so help us out here i think Throw it's actually going. worse than that Give i think us it's more nefarious press. than that well I that's the worse best case scenario i'll tell you what i think it is i think it is because 
Todd McFarlane created a black superhero, and he is white as white can be. Yeah, so the, that is problematic. That, uh, and again, that is something that he got huge praise for at the time. Exactly. But now we're living in like upside down world, where black is white and um, and up is down and round is square and all of those. Things. You know what I'm getting? Yeah, you know what I'm getting. Yeah. At? We're at a point here where I'm waiting, and I'm sure he's waiting for someone to go. You know, you should just give this character to a black man. You should give woman. up your stake. In fact, you should, exactly. you should never have created this character at all. How dare you? How dare you do something? Stay in your lane. I mean, I, that's kind of like the, the narrative that, uh, that's going to be aimed at him if he doesn't say this. I think you're right, here. or at least that's where I'm coming from. I think it goes even farther than the normal bullshit. I think he was sat down and he had a talking to by a few woke individuals who explained... Guess what, Todd? It's a little problematic. You see, you created a black character, and yeah, you're not black. So you don't know what it's like. So you don't know the perspective. See the words he's using? Yeah, exactly. And like I said, I, I mean, I may sound a little hyperbolic, but no. Andre's not right. That's exactly what I was getting to. They're getting to the point where they might turn around and go, you know, you should just give up your stake in this. Give it to the black community or this person or that person and let them have it like literally have it not sell it you know or anything like that and also they're gonna say like you, you should like you should give up all the money you ever made on on this yeah, yeah so of course yeah again this is a game that he has to play before they come come for him because so far they probably aren't aware that this is a black character created by a white man but give them time Give them time for them to like fully catch on exactly what this is, and uh, then he has to like he has to be there before. It's like the same thing like with if you owe money to the IRS or something, you better come to them before they come to you. <laughs> I never actually have heard that, but that's good. that's a good rule of thumb, I guess. Yeah. No, but and, and I think that's why he's saying these things. Um... <sighs> And this is this is part of the problem that we have in Hollywood is you can't tell a story like I guarantee you if Script Doctor were to write a movie with a black lead he'd walk into an office and have the same fucking thing happen to him <laughs> probably it depends on the studio but yeah probably the first question would be who are you to write this type of character exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah, script about that. How can you how can you write ensemble scripts now uh, with uh, scripts that like uh, satisfy all the quotas, uh, so that you have so and so many non-whites in there? And how can you write those characters at all? Um. Well, I mean, from my the way I usually do it when I come up against these types of walls, which is pretty rare to be to be honest. It's I don't get many walls of this of this nature. But I usually have the conversation with the person who's making such an accusation. It's like, well, what's uh, what did you want to see with these characters? And then, you know, first they start with the immutable issues like skin color, age, sex, uh, gender, uh, you know, relationship preference, all that stuff. And then I just kind of work my way down into who the core of the character is. And then I show them quick examples. And it's really hard to get into those types of conversations because usually you're dealing with someone who's got very limited time. who just wants to get out there. There's their their points and then go to their next meeting. But if you can find a way to get them engaged and then you, you know, convey to what's the stuff that's going to make, you know, the biggest impact. Sometimes they're just like, okay, yeah. So you actually already did these notes. It, usually that's what I end up getting at the, by the end of the conversation. It's like, Oh yeah. Okay. So you've already did, did the stuff we want. Uh, I just want to make sure I was checking that with you. That's usually how they, they play it up because um, you know, they're, they're just doing it for whatever reason they have either, either someone from, you know, uh, above them that's saying, make sure it has these points. Maybe it's uh, someone that they're in a relationship with that wants that and they want to score points with them. Maybe there's some sort of social aspect of it within uh, their own community that they want to say that they were, uh, that they did something good and useful, usually to, to kind of hide their own, their own insecurities and their own habits that they uh, might be called on again. They want to get out ahead of that. But yeah, it, it's, it's a really tough in situation. Like even for this one here, um, if I were in Tom McFarlane's position, I would say, 
well, I mean, I wrote this character. It resonated well. It's a success. It already earned a movie in the nineties and it's got a great toy line and everything. If, if you, I would offer them, I'd put them on the defensive side, which I would say, if you know a specific writer that can take what I've made and do it the justice that you think it's there, we can work with him. And then you put them on the spot as opposed to, you know, in some cases where it seems like in this article, Todd McFarlane was told he had to look for, he was the one who had to look for the writer or at least be in charge of or heading up that. Um, well, there's a few people in the chat who are like upset because they're like, oh, he has this much money. He doesn't, he, nobody has anything on him. Okay, well then guys, you have to look at it from this perspective. Then this is his choice. So the motherfucker's gone woke. Okay, though, so it's one or the other. <laughs> like, well, here's the thing: like, I don't think people realize, like, by comparison to whom he's dealing with, especially in the industry, he might not have a whole lot of money in comparison to them. He's worth about three hundred million dollars, and when you want to make a movie for about a hundred million dollars, that's that's a lot of money. That that's you know you know a third of your your value. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, yeah. So again, guys, and and the only reason I'm 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 apt more to believe that he's being pressured into this kind of shit. Is because people are saying King Spawn is amazing, and I, I mean from people in our sphere and stuff. So like, uh, but on top uh, of that, like what he's worth—that's the value assessment of him. That might not be what he actually has in physical assets or an actual liquid right. cash, right? So there's the other—that's the other thing too. It's because um, I like listen. I know actors who just got a nice little boost, and they're being told on the trades that their net worth is like you no know, two point three million dollars, and they're like, I don't have that in my bank account. <laughs> like, and they know. Yeah, Lindsay um, gets what I'm saying, guys. Like the fact that he has fuck you money and he's doing this makes it even worse. <laughs> that, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be. I'm willing to go along with the idea that he's being pressured because, like, yeah, like here's the thing: it doesn't matter how much money you have, like. I've seen it already in a few situations here where if you're not of a certain race, you're not technically allowed right now to do anything in Hollywood right now. I mean, I've talked to a couple actors too. I've heard the same kind of shit. If they're white, like don't expect to have much of a career for very long. <laughs> well, with any actor, even even to a case with writers and directors, the, the, the job that they're on could be the very last job they ever have. In most cases, and in this situation, it's worse. So you're right on that. I mean, yeah. And on, um, like, listen, if Todd McFarlane wanted to financially back his own Spawn film, he could do it possibly with some, because he has the assets to to get a line of credit and whatnot. But he also then has to pay for distribution and he has to pay for all the production and whatnot. And those bills would, you know, that's a big risk on, on his part. And I don't think that's why. I don't think that's what's the first rule of Hollywood you don't use your own money <laughs> to make exactly. something. And and that's why he's going here. He's going to these studios that have billions upon billions of dollars uh, through lines of credit, through liquid cash, through assets and whatnot. And he wants to propel sp this spawn spawn into a franchise that can generate more money for him and for his companies. And I don't think he, the only thing he has to put up is, you know, his, the, the right, he owns the rights to this character. He's putting up the character. He's trying to create a quid pro quo deal with the studios and they have certain obligations that they want to meet in order to get this movie made. And Tom McFarlane can either uh, negotiate with those obligations or he can go for another studio. And he's been trying to get another spawn movie made for the last 25 years. So I think it's more now on to the part of, he needs this movie more than he needs to, um, maintain maybe the integrity of the character or the property at this point. Yeah. Now to go back to something you said before is you've read this, the original script. Yes. Now clearly he says in here that's going to get a rewrite. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like going off though of what you know of the original script, because I remember you talking about a year ago and, uh, and when the story first dropped at what he had kind of planned on doing and you're like, oh yeah, I've read it. <laughs> so again, why don't you tell us what you thought of that, that script? It still wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, like it was it was written specifically to be a very low budget film because again spawn is not really in it he's in the shadows he uh you know he yanks a crook into the darkness we hear stuff going on as opposed to seeing an actual choreographed fight scene well, we don't have any of like the, you know the stuff with like the uh, magically manipulative chains uh, no healing factor uh, of because you know he's an undead type of thing so his body kind of regenerates a little bit but he only has so many so many um times he can do that before he vanishes i believe yeah. Um, yeah, it was very much trying to be um, written as a low budget, you know, maybe $10 million movie. Um, 
that was the intention. I think what might happen here with this rewrite is they might be injecting a bit more special effects, a bit more money, a um, bit more action to to have it be uh, as best of a hit that the studio can make it. And that's why they also think that it needs these certain aspects on the creative side of things and possibly also within the the actual casting and, and character choices itself. Mm -hmm. Andre, anything else to say about Spawn? No, I don't uh, don't think there's uh, really much uh, much more to to say about it. I think we covered everything there is to say uh, about uh, about this. Uh, but we seem to have some breaking news here. Yeah, something we kind of uh, brought up a while back is rumors that we were hearing, and now I guess it's official. Uh, Babylon Five series reboot coming from Michael Straczynski uh, at CW. CW. Yeah, oh, I remember us talking about this, but I don't remember. Yeah, the CW part. I, I remember us saying something about it a while back. Can't this poor man get a network that's competent? Yeah, because I've heard it from a few people now that this was coming, but yeah, this is not. That's not too. Yeah, I, I was just perusing the, the deadline article, and apparently J. Michael Straczynski is in charge of the reboot, according to this. So let's. That's well, that's promising. that's promising. That is promising. Yeah. So, all right, well, we'll we'll look forward to more news on that now that it's official. Uh, Master Clockwork says if a right if a white writer cannot write POC, then no one gets to complain about all the white characters. And if the white writer is male, all the characters must be men. Here's how it works, sure. then, Master yeah, Clockwork. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. We actually did a video about this, but Tom, carry on. You get rid of all the white men. Yeah, because so for instance, in Amazon, they have clothed us. Uh, they have. I don't recall, remember the quote does exactly right now, but like at least like one third of both the production crew uh, of like the high end above the lines. Like for instance, if you have like a writer, a director, and a producer, you have a trio of three people. At least one of them has to be non-white. And uh, and same thing if there's only two, at least one of them has to be non-white, and the, the same rules apply in the script that at least one third has to be non-white, and then there's even more. Then it also has to be like neurodivergent, or I don't even remember off the half these buzzwords, but but basically like uh, the the diversity would be enforced. Uh, so, uh, male, white writer, and uh, all characters must be men, especially if they're white men. That is verboten. So, uh, yeah, can't happen. Of course, it can happen if you do it like independently, but if you want it on Amazon or Netflix or something, yeah. well, that's not going to happen. Yep. So there's the answer to that one. Uh, and I can't bring up any more on screen. Yeah, so... but, uh, but I can. Uh, we have some uh, some more from before. Sure. Uh, Adam Wolford said for $2, I still can't get tickets for Dune for October 22nd. Is that because the tickets aren't out yet or because they're sold out? That would um, be the two reasons. I think that's going to depend on where you are. It may depend on where you're at. Uh, the theater might not know their situation yet, so they may not be... Marketing uh, the tickets, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know some places are already uh, in the U.S. at least. Uh, so I don't know if you're in the U.S. or not, but uh, there you go. And Scooter is glad he has the original Babylon Five on DVD and hold it well. Yeah, yeah. This that. might be in response to its, uh, the popularity of its remaster on HBO Max. I do, yeah. I, well, that's the thing is I've been hearing rumblings since then, and I know I, I think I even seen PJ in the chat earlier. He might have been one of the people that kind of hit me on that. Or there's a few people who hinted me into. A reboot happening, so but, is it, but is it like a complete re remake or a continuation with J. Michael Straczynski? I would be I inclined to way. think it's a continuation. I don't know enough about it, and I don't know enough about the franchise. But I knew I do know there's a few of us in the community that have been uh, reporting on it, and they've been pretty spot on. So just uh, check out their reporting for now until we hear anything more. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. I don't know about the remaster being on Blu-ray, Techman Blade, because isn't it a upconvert? It was like the one using this new technology or some shit. I I don't know the details. I thought I that. heard something about that. Um, unless they did go back and actually remaster it like they did TNG, I'm curious. I I, I don't know the ins and outs on that one. 
I know it was done quietly and it just kind of took everybody by surprise when it was dropped. Uh, yeah, I was pretty surprised and I was really pleased with it. The quality was, was quite good. Well, if that's the case, then maybe they did go back to the do they probably pulled a TNG on it then and we didn't know about it. Maybe I, I can't remember too much of the special effects from the show from when I originally watched it because I didn't I didn't have it on physical media at the time. So and it didn't air too frequently. Um, okay, this is where my confusion came from. Red Rex Rude says the film parts are actually remastered. The special effects are upscaled. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. That does make sense. Because that's also the problem they're running into with Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Is they can scan the film, but then I know they did a lot of stuff on video. So they have a big problem there. And then the, I guess there's a bunch of the guys that did the special effects who still have the files, but then they still got to up, upgrade them. So like it's a... Yeah, exactly. So then they have to like... Uh, first thing is you have to have the files. That's a big thing right there. And you have no idea how frequent it is for uh, for for like those files to be like you know, just spear and not be saved. Or just become uh, incompatible with whatever is around now. There's that problem too. Yeah, that, you get that if you don't change storage device when you have the opportunity. It's not the files themselves. It's rather the whatever storage device that they are that they are on, which uh, which is the issue with that. Well, of course, if you have like different, if you have them in like a. Uh, a typical like a, a folder or a, or a file that is like custom to a certain program and that program updates then yeah of course that can that's be what understood. i mean that's what I yeah mean. this is true um but like I'm, from what i've been told from two different people one of them i think being robert meyer burnett i think i could say that because he i think he said it publicly anyway uh the whole thing with uh D deep space nine and voyager though is paramount don't want to pony up the money <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's expensive to do that. Yeah, yeah, of course. And again, the the rollout for the original, as Mr. Burnett was saying, for the original um, remaster of TNG was season by season when it should have been the full series. Yep, and that was my point of contention as well. And I said that to plenty of people at the time. I'm like, what are you doing? Just wait until you have it done. Put it out in a box set. If you want to do a greatest hits before then, fine. Just to tide us over, but do not do it. This that was so stupid the way they did that because, yeah, well, they have done some weird stuff the last few well, years. Well, you script brought it up because that's what they based on whether or not they were going to do Deep Space Nine and Voyager on, and nobody bought it because they were waiting for the box. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nobody wanted to spend 50, 60, 70, 80 bucks on a fucking season and then have to buy seven seasons of that. shit. They wanted to wait until they could get the whole box set for under 200 bucks. Yeah, well, yeah, the box set was significantly cheaper than season by season. <laughs> Hell yeah, it was. No, but I, yeah, I heard specifically, uh, I think, again, like Robert has said this too, but like, again, from the same, uh, from another source, same goddamn thing is that they didn't sell well enough and it didn't take long for their, like, pfft. they were even kind of pissy about the last few seasons of TNG. If it wasn't for the fact that they used it for streaming and syndication, then it probably would have been seen as a loss. So, but yeah, because I guess that's what amortized TOS's remaster was the the syndication runs of it because they put it out in syndication in a special deal. Uh, yeah, I remember the remaster was being aired on in networks in Canada and in California on affiliates and all that stuff, and it was popular. <laughs> but there's only a third of the episodes in comparison to <laughs> TNG. And I don't know how many seasons. Uh, well, Voyager. the original had three three seasons, seventy nine episodes, right. and Next Generation had seven seasons. Exactly, over a hundred. <laughs> I don't know. Remember how long you know Deep Space Nine or Voyager ran? But I'm still there. At least five seasons well, each. Deep Space Nine was uh, se every Star Trek seven show seasons. for Enterprise Deep was seven Space seasons. Seven, yeah, and, yeah. Seven, Deep Space Nine was seven, seasons. but the thirteen episode first season. Yeah. Yeah. Or as Deep Space Nine was like uh, full seasons, 24 to 26 episodes, every last one of them. Mm -hmm. So if anything, too many episodes. But uh, but yeah. yeah. But yeah, all right. But that's, uh, but that's exciting news. So uh, let's uh, hope for the best. Although I have to say I'm skeptical about the whole CW thing. But we'll see. But before we get into like the violent story, namely Venom, uh, we have a couple of other Super Chats here. 
Luke says for five Canadian dollars, I'm in Canada. I have to be jabbed to see it. I'm not going to. I want to see Dune. I don't have HBO Max. My recourse is shady, to say the least. So, yeah, that's uh, Luke's problem. Might we right suggest Surf, Surf Shark? Yeah, and might we also suggest that we are not doctors and we do not give medical advice or seek a medical profession, all of that jazz. Yeah. So, yeah. Correct. Correct. And uh, Peter Smigelski says for $20, thank you so much. What are the chances that they, uh, D and D, release Dune? They see over the opening weekend what the numbers are in the box office, and HBO pulls it from streaming, calling it a preview so that box office numbers grow. Or is it too late because of piracy? Well, for pieracy, it's too late uh, the moment that it's dropped. That it only has to show for once piracy. for that to be a problem. But, but yeah, but it's, but even ignoring piracy, I still think that they could even do that. That they could just say, oh, it's just a preview, and they pull it out for like the first weekend. I yeah, don't think no, they'll do that, that though. Once it's out, now. once the genie's out of the bottle, it's too late. Exactly. Can't uh, put the genie back in. Now, is there still enough time for them to pull a, eh, we're going to hold it off for 30 days? Oh, that there is. That there there is, but is. I don't think they will. I think they are so dead set on this, the way they've been advertising. It's in every advertisement. This is completely, like, HBO Max is all in on this. They wrote a big check to Legendary for this and Godzilla, so... I don't think they're changing their mind anytime soon. I, if they were going to, it would have been after the last couple weekends, and they haven't yet. Yeah, so. because here's like the thing: it's HBO Max that cut the check. Uh, it's like AT and T and their baby. It's HBO Max. They don't care about the box office. That's Warner mandate. This is something that comes straight from AT and T. Because here's like the thing: you have different divisions with different goals and uh, even if those goals may be detrimental to the to the uh, uh, final bottom line of the company as a whole doesn't really matter each division places themselves first it's the hbo max division which is hell bent on getting the movie uh into into streaming and uh, a at and t are more so behind the HBO Max division than they are the Warner Studios division. Yeah. So uh, you have more cor corporate backing behind putting it on streaming than you have for putting it in the box office. Yeah, all the bur bridges have already been burned. The damage has already been done. And that's what I mean. If they were going to change their mind or do anything, it was going to... It was after that first weekend when the, when it made almost forty million dollars in just twenty four markets, like yeah. that would have been their motivation then. And the fact that it now has made seventy seven million almost, they're they're not budging. So it, it's, yeah, and we'll see how consistent that lasts until the day and date release. So I, I think they could do quite well. They're going to do well, but I even though it's shooting themselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. They're 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 committed to this. Like at this point, this is it. This is their last hurrah to get everybody in on HBO Max. Yeah. So hopefully it does for them what they need. I hope it's worth it. You know, I'm like, yeah, I feel like the boyfriend right now. <laughs> you know, saying so. I hope it's worth it. You know, <laughs> or the the dad or whoever. You know, it's like, yeah, go ahead. But I hope it's worth it. It's not going to work out in the end, but. Uh, I have all the faith in the world that people will actually go to the theater to see it because of Godzilla versus Kong, though. Like, people got out and they went and seen it, even though they could see it on their TV screens, and people are saying the same thing they said about that one. I have to see it on a big screen. So to me, I have this feeling that it's going to do at least well enough, hopefully, to, 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 to get us a sequel out of it. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I then again, it could be, you know, Whatever. I don't know. It's pretty yeah. stupid for them to do this. I, I, I've been saying it for weeks and months, and it's their own fault. Well, time will tell on that one. And then, Tom, you have to say the name. Rod Thunderheart.
says for five Canadian dollars. Hail Andre, hail Tom, hail Script Doctor. I don't know. I'm excited for Let There Be Carnage. I didn't see Chang Chi, but Venom 2, I am. And I agree, Venom 2 is the one that uh, I'm actually looking forward to the most of all of the Marvel themed movies that is coming. Uh, and I'm sure a quite a different crowd is going to be looking forward to the to the movie as well. Because Tom, this is a discussion that goes a little bit way back, but now we've had more recent indications that there's going to be a coming out party of sorts in Venom, isn't it? Well, it's kind of stupid. <laughs> like... <laughs> I, well, first they because like what was it last month they said oh it's it's a it's a it's a romantic comedy between the symbiote and and Eddie Brock, and now they're saying it's more of a gay relationship. It's like what? Who gives a shit? What's the? He's a fucking alien. <laughs> I don't even know if it has a a, a fluid. A it gender. self replicates. It, yeah, it, I mean, it, yeah. It's technically um, the, asexual. I mean. That's what I mean. Like, I, it's kind of like, you know, how you call a certain thing an, a he, even though it's an it. We mean the masculine <laughs> and the feminine because of like how our language is. <laughs> Just kind of like you know when you refer to something, you know, like you know how this recent woke shit has always made me listen to that kind of shit a little bit more, even though I wouldn't normally, right? Like I notice in older TV shows when there's something that is an it or an alien, sometimes they'll just call it a he. Right, or when they're referring to it, even mm -hmm. though we have no idea what the fuck it is, right? I mean, I get that. It's just it appears as this thing, and therefore we right. Associate but we're just it. Yeah. because of the way our language works, like you said, script, we just ha have have to have a way to refer to it, and usually it's just you know whatever. And I'm bringing this up because I've been watching a lot of Star Trek. So like, whenever they deal with an entity where they don't know what it is, it, when they're talking about it in whatever the third person or whatever they'll they'll say it's he wants this or he you know they don't usually say it a lot of times especially in tos it's always he <laughs> and i hate this world now it's made me notice that stupid shit <laughs> uh, but anyhow uh yeah it's a parasite it's a it's a symbiote it's a it's not even a so is it a they now all of a sudden? It's a they them. <laughs> it's a they them. Okay. Yeah. I I liked it when it was an it, but okay. Yeah, I prefer the it. Yeah. It makes more sense. It's the thing. The thing, you know? Come on, man. It's a symbiote. It's yeah. it, it doesn't so, it doesn't have like a specific it refers to its um its kids as spawn as opposed to like anything specific and on top of that, I think even in the comic books, the Venom symbiote has has left Eddie Brock and has invaded his ex-wife at some point, and then she was the Venom <laughs> symbiote creature thing. It. Yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. It's kind of funny. I found something. Oh, go ahead and read that first. Yeah. So Venom. So Vim Vermont says. Uh, so Venom is now a uh, gay pansexual. Says Vim Vermont. Makes sense in current age. Since Hollywood went ultra woke, I've been able to save a lot of money. <laughs> so yeah. Well, what's funny is he's. You know, he had a girlfriend even in the original film, and I think she's coming back for this movie, isn't she? Uh, yeah, she is. Uh, she is. But uh, but here's like the thing. We may talk. We're probably talking about the about the symbiote. Uh, I know. Uh, whereas um, Eddie Brock himself, probably until further notice, is well like one of those problematic cisgender white folk. Well, Unless they decide to change that up too. Surprisingly, this goes back even farther than this whole thing last month where they were talking about being a romantic comedy. Um, I oh, found so, this. It's, uh, so it's, about, it's about Venom and the suit. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are the romantic comedy. Well, no, actually, I found this from a while back. This is from 2019. Ten reasons Venom is becoming an LGBTQA cult film. So there's some precedence for this already. Well, it's amazing what you can read into stuff, right? I I, I just I, I bumped into this. I'm like, what? Well, do you know what that article? What, what that reminds me of? That reminds me of uh, how Tolkien. Uh, is now also an LGBTQ plus icon or something because uh, because a bunch of scholars decided to read loads of stuff that weren't there into his writings. 
So should we should we go into this a little bit and see what they said back in 2019? Yeah, well, for the heck of it, let's do that. Okay, they bring up the reasons that it's uh, that uh, Venom is now becoming an LGBTQA cult film is because gender nonconformity is the tenth reason. <laughs> I don't know about reading all these because the symbiote can attach itself to any species and yeah. and. and uh, 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 mimic the attributes of that. It brings thing. up the point that he uses pronouns. <laughs> we rather than I. It's because it's a symbiote. You dumbass. It's because it becomes two. It's paired. <laughs> because they are a legion. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, and here we go. Just as we're getting into now, queer relationship. <laughs> it's clear that the symbiote is not of the opposite sex either. It doesn't really have a sex. I don't remember seeing a venom wang. <laughs> yeah, what is the what is the sex of an amoeba? <laughs> oh shit! No, 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 no. Polyamory. Polyamory. Okay, so it picks a girl besides just being a guy. It just attaches to whoever it can. In short, it's a pseudo polyamorous relationship. <laughs> I mean, if you saw like the music video by by Eminem, I mean, it's even attached to a dog. Yeah. Okay. What what toxic relationships? What does that have to do with being LGBTQ? That's a good question. There's plenty. There's plenty straight toxic relationships too. Right. So yeah. Okay. Well, let's read this one. While the earlier information establishes the basis for queer coding in Venom, what follows is how queer audiences relate to Venom narratives with and characters on more intimate level. It is clear that Eddie and Venom's relationship is unique in the series, a perfect host. This again draws a parallel to real world relationships. Toxicity in a relationship can leave both people worn out. When a toxic partner leaves, the person rejected may feel dead inside. What the fuck? <laughs> you can't make this shit up. Oh, you don't have to because it's right there. And uh, uh, number six this. gets better. He's yeah. kind of a loser. Uh, again, I don't see how LGBTQA any of this is... people can relate to feeling like a loser. Most LGBTQ people I know are super. Thanks for asking. So, well, I think that most people, period, can sometimes relate to that particular feeling. Say, it doesn't really matter if you're gay or straight. Life is going to shit on you no matter what. Yeah, you're going to feel down at times, but you got to pick yourself up. I don't see what that difference that makes. Uh, I mean, homelessness don't give a shit whose dick you suck or who's whatever you do. Uh, monsters are sexy. Um, really? <laughs> I, I'm at a loss for words on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, their, their reasoning here is, while like Polly Allen Reed, there's no intrinsic link between the lgbtqa community and monster fuckers there's no like intrinsic link between any of these points exactly no. <laughs> there is a distinct overlap between the two as they both are outsiders to the mainstream heteronormative society that we live in this has helped establish this cult. i don't remember hearing any of this shit this is the first time i come across this was looking up the article for for today well, I'm sure the uh, the author thanks you now. Two years later, after he wrote it. Oh but, yeah, I'm uh, sure that we'll get a few videos on this. From yeah, that uh, thanks for the validation, guys. Uh, thirst for representation, adulting. Oh, for crying out loud! This is treating LGBTQ people like they are not people. Oh, that kind of just like Star Trek uh, Discovery, then. Yeah. Yeah. This is insane. Unnatural unions. Um, well, now they're saying LGBTQ is unnatural or exactly. Implying that? That's where I'm starting to get the vibe here. No one expected it to be good. What does that have to do with it being out? What the fuck? This is a very rude approach to it is. reconciling Venom with CBR. You should be canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us up to the current day. Point, which again I, I feel like is about actually not as bad as this article i guess but again it goes with the whole thing we're saying is it shouldn't make a difference he's a symbiote well, I, I don't get it it's no different than an odd couple relationship that doesn't necessarily mean there has to be any sex involved why does it they gotta 
no such thing as roommates anymore. Everybody's in, you know, committed, full, full blown relationships. The humor coming out of the relationship is that Eddie Brock is a timid pussy, and Venom just wants to bite people's heads off. Okay, like that's the dynamic, right? That that's all it is. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Did I lose something in the first movie? That's what it's about. These two coming together and then realizing that they got to work together. So Eddie says it's okay to bite heads off as long as it's bad guys. And that's the movie. <laughs> like That's pretty much it. Am I wrong? Did I miss it? No, not really. I was pretty fun, pretty fun too. Like, I like that movie. Well, I mean, I'm not bitching no. about the movie, but I'm just saying I'm, I, I, they're overcomplicating this. Big oh, time. yeah. <laughs> it's my point. Like, I, like, script gets what I'm saying, where it's basically an odd couple story. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's definitely a, an unusual pairing, and both parties have to try and figure stuff out. Yeah, mixed with a superhero bit. Yeah, although I would prefer him to be introduced as a villain to Spider-Man. I That's, agree. Yeah, <laughs> but with that, I, I feel like we should get to what uh, the the chat has to say. Let's let's see, let's see what the, what the super chats have to say, Andre. What we have left for them. Yeah, uh, see if there are some. First, we have to see what the chat is saying right here. Uh, 176 <laughs> Bam says Venom the sequel, scissoring with your symbiote can carnage. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. And Red Syrup says, Can a symbiote have its own sexuality? Well, obviously, it can right now. Uh, and um, uh, well, the same guy points out, it's all about them helping each other. I guess and Natasha is... says, very importantly, hit that like button if you haven't yet. I guess Carnage is really going to be putting the Carnage into for unlawful carnal knowledge. Huh? Yeah. And Goskar <laughs> Farlat, he has a comment on that yes. article. And reasons? More like 10 insults. I know, Yikes. right? Yeah, if there's anybody in the, in the audience that's uh, LGBTQ, please let me know how you feel about that. I don't want to feel like i'm you know i don't want to assume shit but god damn well if i actually, read that article i'd be pissed yeah Ricky don't get much he has like a really good lgbt point in here he points out for 20 danish krona venom is bert and ernie with cannibalism said. <laughs> well there you go and bert and ernie is another one where they consistently try to make them gay uh, and 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 even friends that I have in the gay community have said they were real pissed when that happened, and it happens every few years. But when it came out last year, because they said that they said it's 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 a stereotype they're trying to get away from because it's just like just because it's like okay, I may be gay, but just because I'm hanging out with a guy does not mean I'm fucking that guy, right? Is what they'll say. So you get this this idea that just because a gay guy is hanging out with another guy doesn't necessarily mean the other guy is necessarily gay, and doesn't mean they're fucking. You know, it just it, it it pushes this stereotype that you know all gay men just fuck gay, uh, just constantly other uh, all the time and shit like that and saying and it's just other bullshit. It's like why can't they just be friends and be roommates? Why is that a problem? Why do you have to change it now? You know, they've fought against this stereotype for so fucking long, and and now they're just trying to ruin like. Anyway, sorry, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm going up and change. Brightest day says regarding Venom, Rule Thirty Four has this covered. I'm not quite sure exactly which rule 34 it, is that like of the. I think oh, they've already he, done it. Rule 34 is, means that no matter what you think of, there's a porn made of it, Andre. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. It means you can't think of anything they haven't already. Yeah, uh, probably. Probably. And uh, Joe Lesher points out they broke Tom. Yeah, they sure did with that one. Well, I'm more <laughs> so I, I'm being careful of what I'm saying. Yeah, like that's yeah, oh, we, we little, really delicate here. When I get in those little like uh spit rages where I can't quite get my words out, it's because I can't say <laughs> what I want. I'm afraid we're gonna get canceled. Yeah, yeah, yeah like Frank Goss, isn't he canceled? He said he confirmed that both and only have no sexuality, exactly, exactly. And I think he pointed out the same thing I did in another interview, too. Is that why does it they have to be gay just because they're guys and they live together? Yeah. They're saving um, money financially. <laughs> uh, Renting on um, Sesame Street's expensive. 
Yeah, and the brightest, uh, brightest day says, "Oh, I was around when Andre learned Rule Thirty Four of the World." <laughs> and also on that note, Six uh, offers the service. Give me a topic, Andre, and I'll look it up and post a porn <laughs> link. Yeah. You probably do it proudly. Uh, Corian Rinch says, uh, "Corian Witch, if I could talk, says as a bi man, yes, this is insulting as fuck." I mean, for God, goddess, good. I think it means goodness sake. I can be into dudes, but not into you. Exactly. You know, just because it's this incessant yeah. need. Yeah. And uh, with, with that, uh, we have a couple of classic super chats. So let's uh, get caught up on those before we move, uh, move on here. Uh, then, because then the next one we have are, um, is, let's see, Mr. Tickle Trunk, who says, I created it, but I want to have another person's voice. Quote from Todd's Mushheads McFarlane, head disc, head disc, head disc, probably meaning that uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk slamming his head into the desk from hearing <laughs> McFarlane's stupid words whether it comes through in my voice or Tom's, but yeah. Master Clockwork says, if a white writer cannot write people of color, then no one gets to complain when all about all lit characters. Yeah, we got that one already, and yeah, they already have a plan for that. Mr. Tickle Trunk says for five Canadian dollars, you can't catch lighting in a bottle twice. Babylon 5 by CW, thumbs down, and JMS is on Twitter way too. If it's a modern audience Babylon fine, there is a boo-boo on my heart. Well, chances yeah, are... I'd, be, I'd be worried about that. I mean, as long as the, the creator can hold on, that's the thing, but uh, I'm afraid... But if, they, yeah, but if the creator is the right person still, and that's not yeah, always the case. That's the thing. Yeah. And then uh, we may get what, get, to quote Gary from Nerd Roddick, we may just get feelings in uh, spaceships. It'd be feeling in a hallway. Your hallway on a, in space, space, actually. Yeah. Hallways in space. There you go. Thank you. And also on the topic of Babylon 5, STR Red Wolf says for five dollars, the special effects were made on 24 Amiga 2000 wow. based new tech video toasters. I doubt they're compatible with Lightwave 3D and TriCaster software. That's what I Yeah, mean you're too. probably going to want... You, you're you're no. right. Yeah, you're probably... No. You also, that's like the other the, thing, and that's a great point that I was trying to... Of thought. Yeah, I was going to try and get to, too, is it's not so much the incompatibility as is the limitations. Yeah. Like, you, you may run into something where... Yeah, like that. Like, you just... You can't render it out in anything no. higher than, than... They'd have to render it out to another software that's compatible with the current software. So it'd have to go through tier process, and both of those are very expensive. That's the thing yeah. is, yeah, you may have to create a patch and or a completely new program just to do it, which could be, like you said, just so... Not necessarily. Expensive. I mean, it, their special effects went by generation by generation, and most of well, the best ones built off of the existing mm -hmm. ones so you'd have to go through that track record but it all depends on how they true how they but that's it. my point though is like it, i'm getting it as okay if you did it as a toaster file did they upgrade and update that enough to where it's compatible and patchable to any newer like adobe after effects or anything like that it depends on which generate well actually no toast some toaster files can go into an older generation of adobe after effects which are still available and then from there on that version you can up upscale it to the current version so like yeah you go on tier by tier uh, steps which, yes. which i mean the software exists is the fact that who has it and how much money will it cost to port it from one over and then after you do that you have to export it and then put it into another one and then export it and maybe per, put it into a cur current one um because yeah. again you have those degrees of incompatibility but there is a pathway to get there it's just very long and very expensive that's what i was worried about yeah well, yeah. thank you for clearing that up or not so much, but yeah. <laughs> Joachim Stark says with uh, 20, uh, that's South, uh, or that's Swedish. Swedish yeah, that's Roman. Swedish. Yeah, so that's uh, it. As long as they do not break in, Tom. And he gives a little rainbow. Yeah. Well, you know, I I'm confident enough in my sexuality. I don't think there's anything they can do. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Joachim Stark also reminds us not to Google Buckcake. Yeah, but uh, the, but there's a the, there's a there's a context. But here. there's a reason for that. Because, uh, yeah, exactly. Because no. Master Clockwork <laughs> said before. Uh, next, we need to educate Andre on um, how do you pronounce that? Buckcake. 
Bukake or Bukake. Yeah, I don't know. It's I think it's Bukake. I think you're right. Yeah. I was gonna say you're close enough to Germany. You probably already know what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I do. I do know what that is. Uh, it's Rule Thirty Four. That's news to me. But when we get into details like that, I'm. Yeah, as you say, I'm close enough to Germany that uh, that I'm quite well aware. <laughs> Even though the word, I believe, is not German. No, but they do all the crazy sex stuff. Though. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> if they didn't invent it, they mastered it. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. No, there's no. So six, you don't need to <laughs> to 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 get a sample of it right away. We know what that is. We can save for us uh, something new that may become uh, comes later. We'll for see. all those who are correcting me in the chat, I say it the other way just to be funny. I do know it's pronounced the other way. So, yeah, but yes. <laughs> Uh, and then we got another one we can bring up here uh, real quick on the uh, uh, Babylon 5 business. Dreamer uh, dreamer out there. Oh, I got it. There we go. Thank you for the $5. And that's a cute little doggy on your uh, icon there. So they had Babylon 5 FX Masters in 4x3. The film was shot protected for 16 by 9 The show was remastered in 4x3, so original effects could be used and upscaled by AI. Yeah, they ran into the same problem with TNG. Uh, Robert Meyer Burnett actually talked about this recently where he had talked about how, you know, since the show was shot on 35 millimeter, they had protection on either side, but there was a problem. The problem was twofold. You had the special effects and opticals were only done in four by three and, or they had boom mics and shit on the yeah. left and right of the screen. Cause they knew it wasn't going to get used. So you, know, you have that problem sometimes. But then again, there's just those few random cases where they've been able to preserve a good 16 by 9 frame within the open mat, and they didn't compromise it in any way. There's been a few shows, like, uh, I think, uh, uh, what was it, Ken Johnson shot V that way? Uh, sure. Yes, the, the miniseries was shot, uh, why, like, 16 by 9, and then... And I believe Lois and, and Clark was, too, but they they haven't gone back and reprocessed it yet. They have not released it as a 16 yeah. by 9, which is unfortunate, because I really want to get that series on Blu-ray. And I know, because you actually can see the comparison, because they have the, uh, I think it was a Comic-Con reel or something like that on the first season's DVD. Yep. And they have the widescreen version of it, so you can actually see that, yeah, it is an open mat, and there's more on the left and right than uh, what's in the four by three. So in those rare instances where, especially back then where people were smart enough to, to be forward thinking, so we're lucky enough, but yeah, you'll run into this sometimes and I'm, I'm not bothered by it. I'd rather just have the HD picture. I don't give a shit if it's in widescreen, as long as they don't crop it. That's yeah. what bothers me. Yeah. That's, that's, they did that's with Highlander. Crime. My God, that was, do yeah. not buy any of the new Highlander series uh, releases. They are, are they crop them. They cropped and upscaled them. Oh my god, that's the worst of all. Yeah, and Dragon Master three hundred and sixty. Yeah, we spoke about doing the first thing we did today. Uh, so um, uh, because I saw that question in the in the chat there, so just head on back to the beginning, and there you'll find the Dune talk. I think wasn't uh, Buffy or something like that another one that was cropped off as well, or something like that. I heard. Oh, I'm sure it's plenty that uh, uh, that have been cropped over the ages. No, I'd rather just give me the four by three. I don't care. Original aspect ratio only. Unless exactly, yeah, exactly. It, just consider this: you don't want it to fill your screen. You want original aspect ratio. Simple as that. That's what you want always. And for stuff that were made for TV and H, where when when the TVs were square and blocky, that means you're going to have black bars on the side. So be it. Uh, so yeah, we got a few more super chats, but uh, we also have Aries who sends in five euros fancy money. Says, yeah. as a German, I am shocked that you think we do crazy sex stuff. <laughs> Isn't Bukake Japanese? And by the way, where is Rob? Didn't see him in a long time. Oh, well, no, Rob, he's uh, he's over on his own channel, so yeah. you'll see him there. Yeah, don't get me started on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was just fooling around, Aries. It's just a, I don't mean to be. Uh, we do not mean any offense to I'm the I'm sure Germans. he's just kidding we're in just, return. We're just, yeah. we're just playing with the with the fun stuff from South Park and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. We know that the Germans are no more perverts than anyone else. No, no, no. It's just that their perversions are more exposed. 
no, Andre got where I was coming from. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and again, I think I believe that Aries is just joking in return. So, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. And uh, with uh, with that, then we are actually caught up on the classic oh, really? super chats as well. I believe oh. if someone thinks that we have left yeah. a super chat behind, now is the time to let us know so we can run back and get it. But I believe that uh, that we uh, we are fully caught up. So with that, I would like to to say thank you to our good friend, Mr. H. Reviews, who joined us earlier today. And uh, of course, I would have to say thank you uh, for this magnificent artwork that we got here as well. Tom, who do we have to thank for this artwork? As usual, it's Mr. Douglas Nelson. Mr. Indeed, Nelson Douglas himself. Nelson rules as always. Yeah, but why am I Venom? I'm so rainy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh, it's weird to finish before three hours. <laughs> well, some uh, some days are um, are just slower days, so I'm sure we'll we'll make up for it for with a whooper on five hours on th on Wednesday or Friday or something. So uh, yeah, but uh, for right now. Uh, again, also thank you to Script Doctor for for joining us. I put your link uh, in the description as well. But uh, let everyone know where they can find you. Uh, well, yes. Again, thank you for inviting me this morning. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Script Doctor PhD, and I also have a YouTube channel where I break down film and television uh, on the on the script writing side of things and story flow. And uh, yeah, I, I had a blast today talking with you guys and Mr. H. Yeah. Always a blast to to have you on, and um, with that we also sticker. have to. Hmm? Yeah, Brett Cohen sent us a super sticker, so thanks for that. And also, later tonight there is toxic femininity. Is there not, Tom? As far as I know, there should be. Um, as far as midnight well, after dark tomorrow, I don't know. Um, yeah, but yes, toxic femininity tonight at. Uh, we changed the time. I believe it's 8 central now, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Yeah, the ladies keep up with that more than I do. But yes. uh, I think it's 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 central. Okay, 8 p.m. 7 central, yes. Yes, we'll uh, have the link for that before. I need to get here. the world clocks above the pewter here, like on the movies. Yeah, that would be, that'd be I'm not kidding. I've been saying <laughs> it for like years now. So I can keep up the with time zone shit. clocks. I think you can get them in a set of five. So you can get like your your West Coast, your 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 time zone, uh, East Coast, and then Andres. <laughs> uh, that's also always a ben uh, benefit to have as well. Uh, yeah, actually, I have that. Like on my mobile, I have like Norwegian time, UK time, and LA time. I mean, I can do that in my mobile if I really wanted to, but I need it to be able to just look at it. You know, like especially when I'm dealing with all the stuff that I have to deal with. Sometimes it's just like it's so much easier to be able to just look at it. Yeah. I even thought uh, about doing it on like a see if I could get like a background on my computer to do that, but I'd be like, oh, I'd always have stuff in front of it, so I'd still have to go out of whatever screen I was to see it. So anyway, with that though, I think it's time for some wet marsupials. I think you and before that, time. before the wet sure. marsupials, I just have to uh, say welcome to first time viewer Dingo Dundee. Well, who welcome. Says he's going to subscribe first time viewer. Well, well, thanks for that. Um, and uh, so just so everyone knows, my voice is clearing up right now. So you can make a look forward to a ton of regular scripted content to make up for the last couple of weeks where that has been lacking. But uh, but that is coming and very, yeah. very soon. And speaking of scripts, then, that means if we can actually broadcast on Mead, we might be doing that Conan King Conan script read. This Sunday. Yes, we will be doing Ooh. that before long as well. So, yeah, do check out Midnight's Edge After Dark as soon as we get rid of the yearly strike that came from false flagging, which we have been subjected to a little bit as of late. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to uh, pop up some koalas in the rain. Night, kids. Koalas in the rain. Koalas in the rain. No fucks given. Koala, koala. Koalas in the rain.